Okay, so yeah, so hi. So everyone, uh, my name is Kira. Uh, this is the first meeting in the Cyclish community, uh, specifically about natural language processing. So for now, this is kind of just a one-off meeting that came out of a desire from some people in the community to learn about this stuff, uh, but probably we'll have more. Uh, so we have many ongoing study groups in the Cyclish community for certain topics like um, data visualization or data processing, whatever. And so it seems likely that there's enough interest to start a natural language processing one as well, but we'll see how it goes. Um, there's also a course coming up that I wanted to mention. So uh, there's been some interest in the community and some efforts from a few of us to put together a sort of um, more cohesive data science enclosure course. And that would probably take the form of like a monthly, roughly um, kind of half a day session where we would get together and someone would cover a topic and then we'd have some time to explore together and, and learn on our own. Um, I guess semi-related to that is also another project that um, I'm working on is a closure data cookbook, which is hopefully going to be kind of like a companion guide to that kind of thing. So the idea is for it to be like a sort of like a book, but kind of more interactive, more, um, uh, I don't know, like a living kind of website type thing. We're not too sure exactly what the published, like what, what tools we'll use to publish it, but the goal is for that to be like a, a sort of living example, collection of examples for how to use a bunch of these newer closure libraries to do data science tasks in closure. Um, and yeah, I guess kind of the high level, like, vision or direction or whatever that the cyclist community is hoping to move in is basically just opening up to other communities. So like right now, um, sorry, I've got two dogs here. So they're a little bit chaotic right now. Also, they're very excited about this topic. Um, yeah, so right now, like as probably everyone knows, like R and Python are kind of the go-to data science toolkits. And there's a lot of stuff that's recently been developed like in the last year or two in the closure ecosystem that makes it, I think, a really viable um, stack, if you will, for that kind of work. And so that's kind of like the big idea that we're kind of working on is like trying to build tools and resources and um, examples and courses and whatever so that people can see that it's also uh, a valuable and useful set of tools for that kind of work. And let me just double check. I had a little couple of things, notes of things that I wanted to cover. I think yeah, so the goal for, yeah, so for, I guess, just also to mention this meeting is obviously about closure. This is a cyclosh community, but we're open to anyone like in general. So it's not, we're not assuming very much background uh, and specifically in closure at all. But on the other hand, if you do know closure and you don't know anything about natural language processing, that's fine too. We're kind of hoping to bridge those worlds. And so that's kind of the goal with this study group, the other study groups, the QuickBook and the course and all of it is to like bring together closure developers and people who are building these libraries and tools with people who primarily just work with data um, in a sort of tool agnostic way and kind of like merge them. So today in particular, we have a special guest, Demid, Demid, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, Demid, um, who is mostly a data scientist working with Python and is gonna teach us a little bit about natural language processing. So we'll spend the first kind of 20, 30 minutes on that. And then we'll go over how to do some of that stuff or how basically how to interrupt with these Python libraries in Clojure, uh, which will be led by Daniel, um, who's the other sort of host here. And then at the end, we're hoping to save the last kind of half of the meeting for basically like a kind of interactive, like collaborative work session. So it's kind of open, kind of up in the air how we want to use that time, but the idea is to kind of give people a chance to ask questions about what we just saw, maybe try something out on your own computer and, and poke around um, while we're still all together here. So this is a really big group. This is really exciting. This is a lot more people than we normally have. So just because there are so many of us, we'll probably skip like individual introductions. But if you want to just, um, like Daniel mentioned, post a little bit about yourself in the chat, uh, we'd love to, to know. And you know, I'll certainly read them. Um, and especially what your background, if any, is uh, with closure, just so we can get a sense of like how um, how to approach, like how detailed to make the closure parts of this meeting, but also kind of this part of the community in general. So 
Um, I think that is everything. I don't know, unless Daniel, you want to say a few words before we hand it over to Demid? No, that, that is so wonderful. And, you know, I just wanted to thank Demid for joining us today. Yeah. You know, such a special opportunity to have uh, somebody of that background kind of uh, offering us this intro. And yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Kira and Danny. Uh, so I'll just uh, introduce myself briefly. Uh, uh, well, I, I'm a data scientist. I work mostly in NLP problems. My background is uh, computer science and linguistics. And for the last uh, year or so, I had the, the honor to be Danny's colleague. <laughs> we actually first met when we were uh, Danny organized uh, some sessions about functional programming, and uh, it was mostly about closure. And I was coming from a Haskell background, so we found <laughs> or tried at least to find a common ground. Um, yeah, so today we'll talk about uh, NLP, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, before, before I start, I just wanted to say that uh, feel free to jump in, ask any questions, clarifications, whatever you want, okay? Okay, uh, do you hear me well, everyone? Yeah, great, okay, so let's begin. Okay, so we'll talk uh, today about NLP, uh, and I'll give uh, my in the first part. Uh, I'll explain a bit about NLP from a linguistic perspective, and Danny will Danny session will be more hands-on and introduce a library called Spacey, a Python library, and later uh, a closure binding. So, what is actual natural language processing? It's basically, um, how would I call it, our interface to interact with computers using the way we would talk usually to a fellow human, whether it's voice, uh, search, uh, trans automatic translations. We, uh, we see it, uh, we find it in our everyday lives, very common nowadays, uh, with uh, virtual assistants, uh, Google search, translations, you can practically find it everywhere. Uh, and just a, a note about terminology, there is another kind of NLP, which stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. So it was once uh, approached by someone on LinkedIn who was an NLP master, <laughs> just so you won't confuse the two. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we'll briefly talk uh, with, uh, what's NLP, what can do for me, and a bit about linguistics. Yes, so as we all know, uh, humans are not the only animals uh, that can speak. Any other species also have a language. For example, dolphins can synchronize uh, their sounds. Uh, and uh, for example, if they hear something about a danger or a whale, uh, Robert, maybe you'd like to say a few words? Oh. Uh... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. They do. They're 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 quite vocal. Okay, I, I just saw that you're a dolphin researcher, so uh, oh, yeah. first time. I'm a, I'm a little <laughs> off guard. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. I just uh, it's the first time, so I, I hear about uh, someone researching dolphins, so <laughs> I was very excited. Okay, let's continue. So as you know, uh, bees have a special dance, uh, which was they use uh, to message uh, about sources of food. And speaking of dogs and cats, <laughs> we, we, I think, uh, we somehow know how to understand them, although we don't speak uh, their language, right? Uh, so here are a few properties about human language. And we actually don't know if other species of animals also uh, possess these properties, but we do know that it occurs in human language. So one, one of the interesting things is uh, displacement. It means uh, we can actually talk about remote things 
both in space and in time. Uh, this ability is also nurtured, which means it's not just genetic, but also something requires re-education and socializations and so on. Another interesting property is, is allowing us to talk about things which are abstract and arbitrary. Uh, for example, we have our uh, language, which is basically as the uh, Susu uh, <laughs> uh, proposed is some uh, coupling of a, of a sign and a concept. And finally, as uh, people with a background in computer science, you probably appreciate that language, our language is recursive. For example, uh, Danny said, the Kira said, the Trouber said, the Demid said, and so on. It, it could go uh, ad infinite. Okay, let's talk about some modalities of uh, human language. Uh, as we, you can all hear me now, we are talking about speech and also sign language and of course, written languages. I think one of the most uh, interesting aspects is that from a finite number of characters, you could create infinite number of words, sentences, and so on. And we all can also have uh, some brain signals, EEG in this case, uh, and may maybe some other modalities. When we speak about human languages, we are talking about different families of languages. For example, the most known one might be the Indo-European languages. You also have the Austrian Asian languages, um, the, <clears throat> uh, the uh, other types of languages. I don't want to go in too much. And here you can see a tree. And uh, as computer science people, <laughs> you'll appreciate this uh, data structure, I believe. Uh, yes, uh, this, for example, is for the Indo-European languages, and you can see, for example, English and uh, uh, languages from the Indian subcontinent, for example, uh, Hindi and Urdu. That actually was uh, an interesting finding in the 19th century that uh, uh, Hindu is an uh, Indo-European language, uh, that this category of Indo-European actually exists, that these languages are actually related. Okay. So let's talk about a bit uh, uh, about linguistics and uh, what, which subfields do we have in linguistics. Uh, so let's start from maybe the most um, bottom level and we'll go our way up. So first of all, when you're talking about spoken language, we have to talking about sounds, which are called phones. And the study of such phones is called phonetics. Here, for example, you can see uh, different sounds and their articulation. Some, for example, uh, P or B are bilabial, which means they're pronounced with both lips. And there are other sounds which are uh, pronounced even further. This is called the articulation place. And we also have distinctions between uh, consonants and vowels and uh, fricatives, and which like F and V or stops like P and B. I won't go into all the details now. Next, we can group different uh, sounds into categories called phonemes. And um, basically, when we're, to we're talking ab about a language, we, are usually, we usually don't want to be very, very nuanced, but, uh, but instead talk about which phonemes it has. Okay, so uh, just a word about this. This is in the IPA, the National Phonetic Alphabet, which is just an alphabet but not of written language, but spoken language. It's a, the basic unit is not a letter, but a sound. So these are the consonants, and here are the vowels. And as we say, we're, we're talking about specific, uh, so the IPA is international, it's universal, uh, more or less. And uh, when we're talking about specific language, we're more interested uh, not in phonetics, but rather in phonology, which means which phonemes are used in language. And the reason is that uh, many people have their own way of pronouncing things, and these differences might not matter so much. They don't affect our understanding. Let me elaborate. For example, we have uh, a concept that is called a minimal pair, which is the minimal change known, uh, which affects the meaning of the word. So for example, if you take uh, the first pair, pen and pin, in English, these are two different words. But for example, in a language such as Arabic, uh, uh, p, p doesn't exist. 
okay? Or maybe in uh, Asian languages such as Chinese and Japanese, the discussion distinguished and the, sorry, the distinction between er, u uh, is not, uh, is not, uh, does not uh, differentiate between uh, words. And so you have other, uh, other uh, differences here. So when we say that uh, two words are uh, have a, a minimal difference that affect their meaning that makes them two distinct words, it's they're called a minimal pair. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I hope you love that jokes. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So the next uh, subfield uh, is morphology, and morphology morphology deals with. Uh, how, how dif different subunits uh, make a word. So for example, let's talk about independently, right? We have this prefix in, the main verb depend, an affix and, and another affix li, okay? So, uh, and each such basic part is called a morpheme. And when we are talking about morphology, we basically are talking about two kinds of morphemes. One of them, uh, the first one is called inflection. Uh, and these are used, for example, in the context of verbs. We can inflect the verb uh, in time, uh, in, the, in, in person, maybe in aspect, depends on the language, uh, in mode. Um, and the other kind of morph, and this morph basically doesn't change the meaning very much in the sense that it's still a verb. But we have another kind of morpheme, which is a, called a derivational morpheme. And it basically turns one part of speech into another one, possibly. For example, from the verb uh, to arrange, I can make the noun uh, an arrangement. OK. Um, so. Uh, so rest assured, no elephant was hurt uh, during the preparation of, of this uh, slide. <laughs> and when we're talking about uh, linguistics, uh, one very important uh, aspect, especially for NLP, uh, is uh, the syntax. Okay, and syntax is basically um, how different words are arranged together to form some meaningful sentences. So for example, here's a, a, an interesting concept called a tree, synthetic tree. We have here for each word, you can see it's a category, uh, a determiner, an adverb, an adjective, a noun, uh, and so on. And these together can form different constituents. For example, uh, the very small boy is together a noun phrase. And kiss the platypus is a verb phrase because it's had here is the word kissed, which is a verb. And in the noun phrase, the very small boy, the head is basically the boy, which is a noun. This kind, uh, this kind of formalism is called a constituency grammar. Uh, and we won't talk about it today a lot. We'll talk about some other uh, kind of formalism, which we'll see in a second. So as we know, uh, uh, every, uh, every word can have one or maybe more uh, parts of speech depending on its context. Uh, here we can see the most common ones like an adjective, uh, adverb, a noun, um, a verb, and so on. And as we saw earlier, it can be combined into phrases such as a noun phrase, a word phrase, and so on. So let's talk a bit about why NLP is a difficult task. So is it, first, uh, unlike languages such as English, where you can distinguish between words using white space, in some languages, it's not the case. Exactly, for example, Japanese here. Uh, another example for, uh, comes from what is called morphologically rich languages, for example, Hebrew, if you can see here uh, the word, uh, uh, the, uh, the letters bet, tzadi, and lamed, and mem, they can very have different pronunciations. 
because basically we don't have the vowels, we don't have the nikud, we don't know how to pronounce this word without the vowels. We only see basically the consonants here. And then another interesting uh, comes from, uh, from English. And the same word can have very different meanings, right? This is a very amusing uh, example. Yes, right. So uh, a buffalo can refer either to the city, the animal, or, uh, or the, the word buffalo, meaning uh, to intimidate. OK, uh, I need a brave volunteer. Someone? <laughs> no takers. <laughs> you need just someone to read these? Yes, the left one, please. Yeah. Well, Anna dressed the baby that was small and cute, spit up on the bed. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so the sentence is a bit confusing, right? Yeah. Because uh, we, we don't have commas. When, when we read the sentence on the right with the comma, it's more clear. Right. Um, it's one of the problem in uh, in the spoken languages. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, an example courtesy of uh, Noam Chomsky, which uh, <laughs> says uh, he wanted to give an example of something that uh, makes uh, perfect sense uh, syntax-wise, but doesn't mean anything uh, semantics-wise. Right, so color is green idea, sleep furiously. <laughs> it's a perfect valid uh, sentence, but uh, what does it mean, right? So we can actually, our um, language faculty allows us to create such, uh, such sentences, which don't have a meaning, but uh, nonetheless valid sentences in our grammar. Okay, let's talk about another interesting type of ambiguity. See, when we have the sentence, Sherlock saw the man using binoculars, actually allows two meanings, right? Either Sherlock is the one who is holding the binoculars and looking at another man, or Sherlock is looking at another man and this other man is using binoculars. So for example, if you look at the syntactic tree, we can see how the S stands for sentence. And we can see that either uh, if, <clears throat> If Sherlock is the one who's using the binoculars, we have here a noun phrase uh, with Sherlock and a big verb phrase when the wor uh, main verb is saw and the man using binoculars and so on. On the contrary, if that, this other man is the one who is using binoculars, we have here, uh, we have here a different meaning. We have here another, another sentence, the man using binoculars. Okay, so that was uh, constituency grammar. And today I want to focus on another uh, formalism, which is uh, used uh, in NLP, more than, uh, more than uh, linguistics, very popular in NLP, uh, which is called dependency grammar. And in this formalism, we don't have this intermediate concept of constituents. Instead, we have this concept of dependency. We start, uh, uh, we start with a concept called the root, which you might be familiar with if you've dealt with uh, computer science trees, right? <laughs> which have a root. And uh, fr from this root, we have uh, edges, the different words of the sentence, right? Which, and this, uh, and uh, when you have an edge from one word to another, it means the, the, uh, the other a word is dependent of, the, of its parent, okay? So in our ex example, uh, saw is the main verb of, of uh, the sentence, and hence it's uh, the root. So uh, formally speaking, um, uh, saw is, is the head, Sherlock is the dependent, and this edge has uh, a label, which is the grammatical relation and in this example, that would be the end subject, which is uh, short for nominal subject. Here we can see uh, a few different uh, grammatical uh, relations. Uh, we all see the nominal subject. We also have a direct object, indirect objects, and so on. 
This, uh, this formalism comes uh, from a framework called universal dependencies, which was uh, basically a very large effort between academia and the industry to basically uh, define uh, such a standard, which would be used by everyone. And they've done a great job by defining uh, all these uh, all, all, all these relations for, uh, for many languages, I think almost 100 different languages. And uh, this basically, this, uh, these labels allow us to account for different, uh, different linguistic aspects, such as the tense, the aspects, the mode. Uh, uh, does anyone here speak Spanish? No, uh, okay. I wanted to give some example about the mode. Uh, all right. And Do you mind sharing that, that Spanish example? Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, if you know Spanish, that you know that in Spanish we have the, well, we have it in English, but uh, only a bit. In Spanish, there is a big difference between the inductive mode and the subjunctive mode. For example, when we talk about wishes, dreams, and so on, we use the subjunctive. So, uh, so I, th I think the, 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 gr the great advantage of this framework in Russell Dependencies is, uh, well, being universal, right? They, they managed to create a standard that accounts for so many languages, which, which is incredible. Uh, here you can, uh, you can see uh, uh, some examples with the, with the head and the dependent. Uh, for example, nominal subject united canceled the flight, or the direct object uh, united diverted the flight to re uh, Reno. Right? Um, you, you might be familiar with some of these concepts. For example, subject and object from your uh, high school grammar classes. So here it's much more nuanced. Okay. Uh, so this table was created by a library called Spacey, which, uh, which Danny will introduce uh, shortly. Basically, we can see for uh, every word here, here's the original sentence. Sherlock saw the man with the hat. I changed it a bit to avoid ambiguity. And for each such word, we can see it's lemma. The lemma is uh, the way the word appears in the dictionary. Uh, we'll, we'll talk soon about uh, lemmatization. A POS stands for part of speech. Uh, for example, here, Sherlock is a proper noun, it's a name. And here, uh, saw is a verb, uh, the determiner, and so on. Uh, here, you can see it's a grammatical label, the dependency label. For example, here, and subject, saw is the main verb of the sentence, and hence it's the root, and so on. And since many of you, uh, understood that many of you have some formal background in computer science and math, I thought it might be interesting for uh, at least uh, some of us to talk about dependency as a, as a, as a graph. So as you might remember from uh, graph theory 101, a uh, graph is basically the collection of uh, vertices and edges. And in, in our context, every vertex is basically a token. A token could mean a word, uh, a period, a comma, maybe uh, some subword, uh, an ap apostrophe, and so on. Okay, uh, we refer, refer to it as token, and we'll soon talk about this concept of tokenization. Uh, the set of edges is basically what we saw: it's just these uh, arcs, which in every arc uh, has uh, this uh, grammatical label. Okay, for example, and such. Uh, questions so far? Okay. Quick clarification: yes. the the V is your vertex in your in your notation here. E is your edges. Yes, uh, V is uh, capital V is the set of vertices, and uh, uh, a small case V is basically uh, some. Uh, for example, VI is, uh, is any vertex, any individual vertex. E capital E is the set of edges. And uh, uh, okay, let me talk a bit. So basically, what is an edge? It has uh, uh, VI, VJ, and R. And we're uh, so basically, it's just an edge, which is uh, basically such a triplet with uh, the starting vertex, uh, the end vertex, and its label, which we 
grammatical label, which we use R for relation. Okay, and uh, as you might remember, uh, uh, we have we can define on every on every vertex uh, the number of incoming edges, which is its degree, degree in, and its degree out, which is the number of outgoing edges. And so now we can finally uh, now we have the language unintended <laughs> to actually define uh, what what is the dependency graph. So some graph G is a dependency graph if it satisfies the following conditions. First of all, we have a single vertex that doesn't have any incoming edges. And this vertex is called, how shall we call it? Does anyone have an idea? Yes, Danny, maybe you want to jump in? Uh, Ravindra in the chat says root. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't see the chat, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, now I see it. Thank you, Ravindra, indeed, that's the root. Yes. Um, and uh, except the root, any other vertex has a, exactly one uh, incoming edge. Okay, and finally, uh, from we can find this unique path from, from the root to any other vertex. Uh, question so far? I know it's a bit tricky. If you don't understand, it's okay. It's not, it's not really necessary for the, for the practical part. It just uh, started to be interesting for people with a CS background. And this is this is based. You made you said on uh, this this universal dependencies is able to 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 show that this graph theory applies for uh, multiple many many languages. Uh, well, the the universal dependency is just the standard of uh, relations. So okay, basically. Okay basically define such a concern it, it, before that we had the uh, different uh, efforts by the industry you know, google and mm -hmm. in the academia stanford they basically defined the common standard which i find it uh, incredible okay so um I won't speak today about the algorithm we use to build these parse trees, but let's talk a bit about how we evaluate them. So we have this concept of the tree bank. Tree bank basically means it's a, a, a corpus uh, of sentences and uh, their uh, respective uh, trees, which was usually annotated by humans. And in order to evaluate uh, such an algorithm, to build a tree, uh, we have two metrics. Uh, LAS and UAS, which stands for labeled attachment score and unlabeled attachment score. So basically, for every pair of a head independent, if we can uh, actually uh, recognize the pair correctly, uh, we say it's an unlabeled attached uh, attachment score match. And we and if we match the pair and also correctly recognize the labeled, the grammatical relations, that would count for an labeled attachment. And so the LAS and US basically sum these individual scores uh, to have uh, basically some score uh, things from uh, like a percentage where 100% is the, the best you can do. Uh, for example, uh, Danny will show us soon Spacey and for each model Spacey, you have different metrics to see uh, how well uh, it works on different, uh, different tasks. And here, oh, sorry, oh, I think it was cut off. Oh, uh, no, here you can see it here, uh, DAP UAS and DAP LAS. This is, for example, a model called uh, TRF based on transformers, okay, uh, in English. Basically, you can see, and uh, as you might have expected, usually the UAS will be higher than LAS since its task is simpler. It doesn't have to recognize the, the label correctly. Okay. So let's talk about an interesting uh, task in NLP, uh, named entity recognition. Uh, and this task, our goal is to take some text and find all the entities, all the named entities, which could be some uh, person, a date, an event, uh, um, 
some political entity, GP, geopolitical entity, for example, India here, and so on. Okay, so here we have some text about uh, Pfizer. And here you can see it after uh, being, uh, after the named entity recognition, the error process by Spacey. You can see here the uh, different labels, for example, Pfizer is an organization, BioNTech is an organization. Uh, one is a cardinal, cardinal number. The United States is a GP, geopolitical entity, and so on. Now, uh, I'd like to, uh, before we get to the dealers, I'd like to talk about uh, something uh, very basic. This, how do we start? We have such a pipeline where we usually start with tokenization. We start with such a tax. And we want to split it into tokens. And this process is called tokenization. For example, uh, we, we, we can start with something like this, right? Drug, giant, Pfizer, and its partner, and so on, right? Now I have a question for you. Can we simply, in English, can we simply use white space to, uh, to tokenize the text? No, don't we have lots of hyphenated words and other, other cases where that, that would be too, too blunt of a tool? Yes, exactly. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and a related question, if you want to first uh, split into sentences, can we simply use dots? Yes, uh, I don't hear anyone. Uh, Des decimal points are gonna throw it off. That's right, that's right. Okay, let's see. Uh, right, so for example, initials might also pose a problem. Right, and uh, we have uh, uh, different words uh, like don't, which need to be do and nt, which need to be, they don't have a white space, but nevertheless, they should be two separate tokens. Okay, so today, yes. Oh, question marks and exclamation points will be a problem too. Exactly, exactly. Right, so today I want to talk about uh, very briefly about uh, two different uh, methods, two different approaches to tokenization. Uh, one is rule-based. Basically, it has, uh, if you see a comma or a, if you see a colon and if you see an apostrophe followed by S and so on, you use it as a suffix and handle such uh, special cases as can't, won't, had of, and so on. Okay, this is basically comes from the very first version of Spacey. And here you have the code. I uh, won't go into the details. Basically, check the prefixes. And if, if it matches one of the cases, it appends, and then checks the suffix and so on. The details are not very important. And I also want to talk about a different approach, um, which is used by today by uh, the state-of-the-art models called transformers. You might have heard of, about, about BERT. I think it's the most famous. It's a work by Google from uh, 2019, uh, which had uh, an incredible success in many NLP tasks. And the first step there is the tokenization and to use an algorithm called byte burn coding. And basically, uh, it, it, create, it tokenizes it into subwords. And it's a statistical algorithm and it takes, that starts, first of all, where every single character is its own talking. And using some statistical patterns, uh, these ones are combined step by step. For example, I might start with T, H, and E separately. And then I start with uh, T and H, T and H, E, and so on different, uh, for example, suffixes such as U and N, an or N and so on. Okay, so le let's uh, look at the Viper encoding version. Why do I have this crossed? Uh, strikes, so I don't know. Okay, so we have, for example, um, drug giant Pfizer. So it, for example, for some reason saw that Pfizer uh, uh, is made of uh, three different tokens, okay? 
and, and the same for BioNTech. Uh, but it dealt very well with coronavirus. Yes, so, um, uh, so what I wanted to ask you, if someone has an idea, when should we use which approach of tokenization? Okay, I'll let you think about it. And I want to talk about another common stat that we use in NLP, which is called stemming. So if you remember the slide about morphology, uh, stemming basically uh, is the process of removing inflectional morphemes, right? So if we have a verb such as arranges, we can uh, normalize it to arrange. And a very related concept is columnization. And when we remove both inflectional and derivational morphemes, example from arrangements called arrangement and then arrange. Uh, these tax normalization techniques are basically used uh, to group different concepts together. For example, if we have a task of um, class classification, for example, uh, classifying the intent of the user in a chatbot. Another common uh, technique of uh, uh, of normalization, basically removing stop words. Stop words are basically words that don't affect the meanings. They're, they're uh, they don't really uh, they don't really matter for our purposes. Okay, for example, the, a, and and so on. Now maybe you have some uh, other idea. How could we normalize the some noisy text? Okay, I'll, I'll let you think about it. And that's all, <laughs> at least from my side. Uh, maybe you have any questions. Okay, so Danny, uh, maybe you'd like to proceed? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, what do you think, Kira? Uh, should we switch to my part or uh, would it be good? Yeah, I guess that makes sense. If nobody has any like pressing questions for Dimi, I mean, feel free to ask them anytime or put them in the chat or whatever. But uh, yeah, unless there's anything to say, I guess maybe it makes sense to yeah switch over to Daniel if you want to show us some examples closure yeah thank you so much i think i'll stop the recording for a moment uh, so that we chat about our hopes for a moment uh, free sure, sure. and then we'll, we'll uh, come back to it yeah so we're, we're back at the recording after we had some chat and um now um i'll share my screen and we'll go through some notes about what we're hoping to do in this session and in the future. And uh, share screen. Yeah, I think you can now see my browser. And um, yeah, maybe maybe let us discuss what we're trying to do today, at least. So um, the hope in the near future is to have a closure data science course as Kira explained in the beginning. And we are not there yet, just figuring out some tooling and uh, problems and setup and, and such, it will be there soon. And what we're doing in the meantime is exploring different topics and NLP is one of them. But for this topic, it makes sense to actually have a series uh, of sessions because uh, there are different layers uh, to, to about this topic and what Dimit was presenting us was like a certain fundamental layer, so to speak, and we will practice it. But to actually build NLP systems, we need more layers on top of that. And we will not see them today. We'll just play with the linguistic layer uh, uh, in a sense. 
And um, the goal is to have this exploration to get a sense of that layer and also look into it as a beginning. And that is why, you know, we will keep asking about your hopes, about what you are hoping to, to get up, out of these sessions. And yeah, so that does this make sense? Any comments about that? Checking the chat. Yeah. Mm. Looks pretty great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and you know, I should give these disclaimers. I'm not an NLP expert. I'm a statistician, a data scientist. In a sense, I'm a student of DMID. I ha have been learning and learning a lot every day from DMID and a few of my other colleagues asking them questions a lot. What I will present here is playful exploration in closure. And um, another disclaimer is that, again, we are just looking into basic methods, like in a sense, a fundamental layer, one of those layers that other algorithms can be built on top of. And a few resources worth looking into, uh, libpython CLJ, oh, sorry for the typo, is a, a bridge from Clojure to Python. We will use it today. We're using, we today and in other sessions, we will keep using Python libraries for this field of NLP, even though there are Clojure options and we will explore them too. It makes sense in this field to have the best in class algorithms and the, the, the those parts which are becoming kind of industry standards and get a sense of them. And there is no reason not to use them in closure. And we know that closure, in a sense, is a way to look into other runtimes, other technologies, and kind of maybe liberate them and make them simpler to use. And I think that is an example of that, what, what we will be seeing today. And Tablecloth, this uh, magnificent table library by our friend Tomas is something we will be using today. Spacey is a Python library for NLP. We will use some of the linguistics and patterns and, and such of that library, not all of it. And I put a link to a nice uh, glossary uh, that it has. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, where you have those different uh, notions of, of parts of speech and, and their relationships and such. Uh, that is a re useful resource. And there is a, a nice blog that maybe some of you know by Karin Mayer. And Karin has been exploring the relationship between Clojure and Python and the ability to use a few of the famous Python uh, packages for deep learning and NLP from Clojure. And Spacey is one of them. And there are also a few tutorials by Ethan Miller, who is here today with us. Uh, I'm not sure about the up-to-date version and maybe they will be revised one day, but uh, I just had to mention them because they were so great. And the uh, artist data set uh, that Dimit suggested I could use in this session is something we, we will play with. It is a data set where people are having different, uh, you know, text chat requests about flights like asking about, uh, you know, um, uh, when can I get a flight from this place to that place and such. And some natural processing problems uh, can be uh, tested on this uh, data set, uh, kind of, uh, which is, offers a nice real world example, and we will play with it. And I uh, did really thank you for this. It, it really made sense, I think, for this session. And a few links for the broader picture, there is a nice playlist of, of short explanations of notions of NLP for people of programming background by Rachel Tatman. Uh, it is part of this RASA project, which is an open source uh, project for uh, so-called conversational AI, which is you know building chatbots and chat and such. And they have actually good tutorials and this a series of very short explanations of notions and the practices around them has been very helpful to me. 
And data linguist is something we should mention. It is a, a closure library. Uh, uh, let us uh, look into it by our friend Simon Gray. It is wrapping another piece of technology called Stanford Core NLP. We should play with it in the future, just not today, because for pedagogical reasons, Spacey felt so right, and also because Spacey is so right for certain types of problems. And but that will be a topic for future sessions. And hopefully Simon will also teach us about it one day. And maybe maybe there is a link to the historical topic thread where uh, a few of the psychological community uh, members have been discussing using Spacey from Closure a few years ago. And that is actually where the bridge from Closure to Python began uh, when they realized they need a nice way to use Spacey. And uh, there were Alan Marazzi and Chris Nuenberger, of course, the author of the bridge from Closure to Python. And uh, a few of them, as well as Ethan Miller, has been exploring this field of uh, NLP through Interop and Karen Mayer that we mentioned. And uh, all the conversations are so interesting to look into. And yeah, so now I guess it would be a good time to explore. And maybe, uh, what do you think, Kira? Maybe after a few questions, it would be a good time to have a short break. Yeah, you mean before your demo? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, it's been, actually, oh my gosh, it's already been almost an hour. So um, yeah, why don't we do that? If anyone has any questions, comments, now would be a good time. Otherwise, yeah, maybe we'll pause for about five minutes, give people a chance to take a little break and come back around 3.35. Sounds like, I know it's like intimidating to ask questions in a big group of strangers. So um, okay. we're all also available on um, the Closure Slack and Zulip. There's like a whole bunch of places on the internet where uh, all these people hang out with the Closure verse. They're all basically like some form of closure, closureians or something like that. If you Google, you'd be able to find, if you want to ask like questions one-on-one -on -one to anyone or to the community later. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's do that. Let's take like a little five minute break and we'll reconvene at 3.35 or I say, I keep saying 3.35, like wherever <laughs> you are in the world, uh, five minutes from now. Here we go. Yeah, thank you. So now we are after the break. And what we'll be doing now is play in closure with Python and Spacey that we need mentioned. And maybe, maybe just let us have a short look into what it looks like to use uh, you know, Spacey in Python, just to make sense of it. Uh, and um, yeah, I'll share the screen and uh, bring the right window. So I think you see now my VS Code uh, window where I have some Python code. I could use Emacs, but I yeah, don't know why I'm here at VS Code. And um, uh, so you see a few of the spacey libraries. It will be brief just to have like a sense of the usual way to, to use these things. Spacey, that I did mention, is a closure. Uh, uh, sorry, a Python library, uh, mostly written in Cyton, which is this more efficient way to write, in a sense, uh, something which looks like Python, but is compiled uh, efficiently. And it offers a few layers of NLP and linguistics. And on top of that, a few machine learning uh, 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 parts, uh, a few parts of the relevant machine learning func functionality for a natural language processing. And uh, Dimit, please add uh, whatever you find right to add about it. Uh, we will just have a little, little play with a few of the more kind of uh, obvious uh, first steps with it. And the way uh, people use it mostly is loading a certain uh, model of the language and there are a few of these, and here I'm loading the medium one. You could load the smaller one, which would be quicker to load, but, but less sophisticated. And that uh, knowledge base 
provides a set of, of kind of supports the functionality we will be using. And uh, uh, what we do now is uh, create a matcher, which is one thing that people do. Uh, Danny, uh, yeah. may I jump in? Uh, yeah. just, a, just a small comment about uh, the uh, naming scheme of spacing models. So first you can see the language, here it's English. Core means it uh, includes all uh, spacing functionality, for example, the parser, tokenizer, uh, and identity recognition, so on. Web means it's the that it was trained on. For example, here it uses uh, some common crawl corpus. So there are different spacing models for different languages, uh, uh, different sizes, like Danny mentioned. Oh, yes, and MD stands for medium, just like Danny said. So, uh, and it's, it's basically, it's uh, when you're working on some NLP task, you should make sure uh, the model you use was trained on similar data or as close as possible. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, and so you see now we create a certain Python object called a matcher, which depends on the the vocabulary of the knowledge base we have just loaded. And uh, we can use this matcher to match for certain patterns in texts. So for example, here we can define a certain pattern we may call hello world. So this pattern says we have one token, remember the mid was telling us about tokenization, kind of uh, tearing the text apart into a sequence of tokens. So the first token in lower case would be the word hello. The second token would, uh, would be a punctuation mark. And the next token would be in lower case world. So we can add this pattern to our matcher. Oh, an error. Oh, right. I haven't evaluated this. Sorry. Now it is loading and it takes some time to load. And now we can create the matcher. And then we can. Uh, oh, sorry. Have I duplicated it? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry for this. Yeah, so um, so now we can create what we call a document, which is applying our NLP functionality to a given piece of uh, text. And by applying it, we, for example, get tokenization of it. In general, we would get a certain uh, pipeline or pipeline of operations applied to our text, where tokenization is one of them, but there could be also entity recognition that is happening here, but is not relevant to our example. That would, for example, recognize names of cities, right? So we, this NLP function is a certain pipeline of a few operations that Spacey applied. And then we could ask our matcher to met match for this document, which is the object representing the result of the pipeline over our text. And then uh, when we ask for that, uh, oh, yeah, then we can ask what the matches are. Oh, sorry. So uh, we get a certain sense that the was a match. Why only one? Why this pattern we defined only had one match in this text that says hello world twice? Any idea? It's the punctuation in the middle. Yeah, thank you. So our pattern says we should have hello, uh, some punctuation and world. So it wouldn't capture the second one, right? So we could kind of keep playing and, and, and make this more flexible and make this uh, middle one optional and such. All of this is supported. Each of these uh, D 
dictionaries, uh, as they call them in Python, can have a few items that uh, make the situation precise and, for example, uh, add more about this. So, for example, we could say the lower case of this is comma. So now we are more specific. We're being more specific and we're still capturing this one example because it, it was a comma, but if it would be a semicolon in our uh, pattern, then it doesn't capture this hello comma world uh, text, right? So, so these, these dictionaries can uh, provide the details about what we expect a certain token to be. And later we will play more with that. So that is a little taste of, of these matches and uh, maybe uh, uh, another example, what happens if we say hello Helsinki, um, then, um, sorry for this. So hello Helsinki, we create this document. Let us look inside what we have there. So this document, it prints as hello Helsinki, but it is no longer just the text. Um, it, maybe let us call it doc, doc one. Oh, sorry, doc one. And let us look into doc one. So actually it is, it is um, uh, a sequence of tokens and some details about them. So we could ask about the first token, which is hello, and the second token, which is Helsinki. We could ask about certain properties of Helsinki, for example, what is the part of speech? So it is a, a proper noun. And we could also ask about the entity type. And then, is it a person? Now I, I'm in so, so, really surprised. It was supposed to be a, a geographical location. So, um, oh, I just switched the, the language model probably. Or oh, I, I, I have no idea what happened. But right, I expected it to be a, a geographical location. It was there. <laughs> earlier today, but maybe we should not uh, spend time on this. But you see, we could look into a sequence of tokens and ask about the properties of these tokens. And uh, yeah, and, and that is something we'll look into more uh, in closure later. Um, so that was a little taste of how the, the uh, Python people use uh, Spacey. Maybe I'll share the screen again. And um, uh, sorry for this and uh, show some visualization. So for example, we could take this uh, buffalo, buffalo, buffalo uh, sentence and look into it as a series of tokens and the dependencies that Dimid uh, explained. And I think it shows also the part of, yeah, it shows the parts of speech and you see it fails to understand the meaning that some people may have when they say this uh, buffalo, buffalo sentence. Um, so you see, it, it is hard. Uh, Spacey wouldn't always actually capture the, the actual um, meaning. And maybe another thing worth looking into is, um, is uh, this ability to take uh, a certain document we created from a text and have with the, like a table of all the tokens and different details about them. Uh, and yeah, so that, that was just a little taste of it that I think it, it was right to make in Python just to see how it usually looks. And now we will go about closure. Any, any comments so far? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ryan, for mentioning this render method. It is so handy and, uh, and yeah, we will, We'll see a little more of it uh, in a moment. And yeah, and so, yeah, so maybe, maybe now, uh, you see, I created a little, um, uh, is it big enough? I think it is uh, the screen. I created a little uh, namespace in Clojure with a few wrappers in Clojure to the, uh, 
relevant modules of the spacey uh, python package and i'm using lib python clj uh, and uh, this is this amazing library by chris nonberger which allows to have a bridge from closure to python this session is not about lib python clj and uh, we will not dive into all the details of it maybe maybe we uh, if anybody has questions we'll look inside a little bit but we'll just use it and enjoy it and the idea is that we can have closure functions which are actually python functions acting on python values and we will see that in a moment uh, so you see for example you can require python which means do something which looks like the closure require but is actually requiring uh, Python modules as if they were closure namespaces. So after we do that, uh, uh, we we have uh, some um, namespaces in closure like spacey, which is the equivalent of the Python module called spacey, right? And we will just use them. And for example, we can take a document. Remember, document was what we get when we apply our NLP uh, object in Spacey of a piece of text, right? Which is a certain pipeline of NLP operations acting on this text like tokenization. So if we take a document like that, then these documents are uh, almost always sequences of tokens. And we see that we can take the document and map over its tokens and to each of these tokens we can see you know since these tokens are python objects we can extract certain members of these python objects like the part of speech that we saw earlier in python and please don't worry about it if you don't understand the code completely we will have a session about uh, the python clj one day and we'll dive into these details but i think you're getting the sense that we can for example just ask for members of a python object and then you know we get a sequence um, maybe it should be maybe kind of play with it a little bit so we can take a piece of text like hello world and we can apply to it um yeah, maybe let us bring this in the beginning uh, it makes sense so uh, remember we had something like that in python where we are loading our knowledge base which is in a sense uh, an nlp pipeline of operations like tokenization and when we apply nlp to it then what we get is oh sorry uh, we get this thing that prints as hello world but is actually uh, a sequence of tokens and now we can we can play with it so this is what we usually call the document and so we can map over the tokens of it or maybe let us just take the first token so oh sorry first uh, so you need to apply the object first uh, what do you mean to uh, in, in apply the NLP object on the text. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. So I should have explained. Yeah, thank you for. You should stop me more. So what we did here is create a closure function called NLP, which is this pipeline of spacey. Uh, in this case, the small knowledge base, and this now acts as a closure function. So we could say we could apply this function to hello world. And we can also write it this way, which is just a different way to write it um, with this so-called threading macro or pipe as they sometimes call it in different languages. So this says, take this text and apply this function. And now when we get that, we can take the first element and this first element, it prints as hello, but it is actually a token, so it has more information about it. Uh, so that any, so that name is shadowing the NLP function in that we saw in the Python spacey code, right? Yes, 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. Cool. It is a closure function. Well, behind it, we have a Python function. So when we pass a, a handle to a Python value to it, it would act on that Python value. And when we pass a certain closure value like this string, it would act in a sensible way, actually passing this closure string to the Python function and getting the Python object, which is the result. And yeah, and it is so seamless. I just forgot to say that a few of these things are actually happening here. And it feels this seamless. And, and we could say more about it, and it is tempting, but I should stop myself. Uh, and libpython CLJ is, is amazing. And it is like, yeah, never mind, some other time. And yeah, so um, yeah, by the way, um, all these um, notes will be shared in a few days after some cleanup. And, and I know I say it, uh, and, and we, we, it is related to our exciting uh, effort to make the tooling and set up uh, more, more uh, clear and simple. And, and that is clarifying. And in a few days, we'll have these things set up uh, in some notebook like uh, uh, setup. And yeah, and now um, uh, we could take this thing and ask for its members, right? So, for example, we can apply uh, a Python the famous python function that um, is called dir that would i hope i got it right yeah it returns this whole uh, uh, list of members so we see it has all these things so for example one of them is the python member um, part of speech Oh, and it turns out that hello is this part of speech. And I don't even remember what that means. I remembered yesterday. So I look up in the glossary. Uh, so that is what they call an interjection. And I forgot what that is. I remembered yesterday. Uh, Dimit, any comment about that? Um, just uh, note that you have in Spacey both uh, POS, part of speech, and also tag. And the difference oh. is that the tag is the more nuanced one. So you, you, if you want something more fine-grained, you might uh, want to use tag. Oh, so the tag is uh, which is, yeah, in this case, maybe not so much refined, but yeah, it helps so much to know that we have these two levels. And, and uh, you see, I, I'm using these members with the underscore in their names. You also have those without the underscore, but they are, um, some numerical codes of these things. Uh, so to make sense of things, uh, to make them readable, it, it is nice to have the string of the presentation, and which is in some uses less uh, efficient, but uh, more readable. And yeah, so that is that. And then, you know, we can have, do that and take a document and actually turn it into a whole data set. So let us do that with the world. You see, and I'm using here this table plot library, which creates data sets, which is, you know, tables. So, um, um, talk to data set, uh, this function we defined above. So it would look, look, look uh, like that. Um, right, so it is a, a table, right, like they had in Python. And but it is a closure table, this efficient, amazing TechML data set we have in closure, which is wrapped by this efficient, so nice uh, uh, and so beautiful tablecloth library. So we can have these things uh, in this shape. And now let us have this match we had um, uh, in, in Python. So I'll skip the details, but I'm kind of repeating the, the Python process of creating a match with a few patterns and we will create those patterns we're matching for, we'll create them in closure. And in this case, we'll pass them as JSON to Python. Not the most efficient way, but just was easy in this case. Uh, you can be more careful about the way you're passing values to Python and uh, there is some room for improvement for efficiency, right? So um, uh, 
yeah, so now we have a function to match a little piece of text with a few patterns, which is just doing whatever we saw there in Python while matching. So let us use that, for example. I think I have, yeah, maybe, maybe let us copy this. So yeah, maybe like that. Oh, oh, I didn't define it. Oh. In a moment, we'll see what might be wrong. Oh yeah, I, I just missed uh, some function definition. So you see, we're um, getting we're getting two matches for this uh, text and this pattern and we could remove this comma and then we'll only get one match right because our pattern asks for some punctuation between the two words the two words uh, is it making sense we are just wrapping some python functionality in closure and playing with it um so um, yeah, and, and we saw this displacey uh, uh, Python package that gave us this nice dependency plot, and it also uh, has a dependency graph, and it also has a certain visual representations, the representation of entities that we'll see in a moment. So I'm wrapping it in a certain way in Clojure just so that we can visualize it in our tools, and yeah, or maybe maybe in a moment uh, we'll get to it, but first let us take some sentence from our actual data set of text messages about flights and uh, pass it to our NLP Python uh, function. And you see we're getting this table of, of uh, all the tokens and a few of the uh, features, uh, the properties about them. So for example, want is a verb, which makes sense, right? And any comments about this, Dimit? Uh, if you um, No, you, you might, uh, if you want, you may add uh, another uh, onto the pipeline of uh, NER, named entity recognition, if you'd like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let us do that, actually. Thank you. So, uh, would it be just the entities, I think? The ent type? I think so, yeah. Uh, hmm. okay, let's call it ent type. And yeah, so now, yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, Dimit. We needed that. So we see now, Boston is something of entity type GPE, which is a geographical entity. And this uh, pair of words is something that represents time, right? Because it is like 8.38 AM. Uh, does it make sense? Any comments, any questions? Yeah, and, and Dimit, again, thank you for picking this data set. It, was so much the thing that we needed for this session, I think. So now let us see Displacy at work. Displacy uh, can help display uh, spacey objects. So for example, we can ask to display the dependencies, uh, this, this function that we defined here. So uh, we'll get it here in the, oh yeah, we will maximize. So you see, we get the dependency graph of this sentence with all the relationship between words. Let us maybe focus on something that makes sense. So, so, um, so, uh, for example, want depends on I because uh, I is is the subject subject who is the the, the one to to want something and so on, right? 
and and for example from depends on Boston and so on. Yeah, so so we have this information and sometimes it would be useful. We'll not play with it so much today. Maybe maybe a little in the exploration uh, we have later. And another way to display uh, uh, a document is by coloring the entities. So I think that is really nice and and um uh, my colleagues at work i see them working with these text and they they coloring that they're coloring everything and i i need to learn from them to use this more so you see we can have this entity as a geographical entity and this as a time entity and so on and this a date right great so now let us go about the problem uh, that we we are looking into we will not have any great solution to our problem. We'll just explore it a little bit. So I'll have this other closure namespace. And in this namespace, we will look into this uh, ATIS data set that we uh, looked into in the beginning. And maybe, maybe let us have a reminder of what it is. So, um, right, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, so so um, this is a data set of text messages of people who are interested in flights, in asking about the time or or the the rates or you know scheduling or so on, and uh, it is given in different formats. And one of them is the so-called uh, RASA NLU JSON format, which is a way to represent a, a set of texts and some information that needs to be ex extracted from them. So we see that these texts were annotated with some uh, information that can be extracted from them. This was probably done by a human saying the intent of this text is looking for a flight. And intents are this, you know, general idea of looking into uh, pieces of text and somehow simplifying the meaning very much in a, gen in a very generalized way, like uh, categorizing them into a few uh, different uh, 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 meanings, general meanings that people could be talking about not very details but very much simplified and it is a very common practice in nlp systems to build a, a system by first recognizing some intents and then going more detailed about it and you know that is some of the practice i'm learning uh, these days from dimid and my colleagues and uh, you see uh, this was annotated probably by humans as a way to test the ability of a certain algorithm to recognize those intents. So these data would typically be used for training machine learning algorithms or some other algorithms and testing them. So we have a training and a training set of data like that and a testing set of data like that. And this practice of training and testing so-called supervised learning we will have more of it in future sessions and today we'll just look into the training set and play with the ability to maybe maybe recognize some of these details and you see we don't only have intents but actually detailed entities so for example in this text we have this entity of the city name they wish to be flying from and this is charlotte right so uh, yeah, and you also have the so-called span of where it exists in the text. And so these are the data. And uh, maybe I should, I'm kind of stating the obvious thing that when we see something like that in Clojure, as, as Clojure developers, we have this happiness about this moment because we know that working with JSON in Clojure is such a joy. And, and I think it also um, kind of applies to Spacey and the whole ecosystem around Spacey uh, because 
it is also very much organized around uh, data structures, nested data structures like these patterns, which is something that we like and enjoy to create and manipulate in closure so much. Um, and, and that is the moment where closure can be liberating in given some functionality, which has, you know, can be actually accessed in a very declarative way. So now we will play with this data set a little bit. Uh, any comments, any questions? Yeah, so, um, right, so, so, uh, you see, I'm I'm loading this data set uh, from the relevant path, and um, I'm I'm doing some data processing, getting it as a tablecloth uh, table. Uh, so you see, we have the intent in one column, flight, and the text, and then the nice thing is that we can have all these entities in a in a kind of in a data set inside this column and in in a tablecloth and the underlying TechML data set library this is very much efficient this ability to have uh, data sets inside data sets and so on and and uh, yeah and and we have these data does it make sense that these texts were annotated with intent and entity information maybe we should uh, um reorder the columns right uh ah, never mind yeah uh, you see uh yeah so that is the text and it has intent and entities and that is the information we are hoping al our algorithms to learn to recognize right and yeah so so now uh we have both the training set and um and the test set, which is this common practice of dividing our data into something we're practicing and learning from, and the, the part where we only test our algorithms without even looking inside ever, right? And, um, and typically in future sessions, we will be more careful and take our training set and divide it further for the part we will be enjoying for our practice and exploration. And another part we may put aside for vali validating our algorithms. These things are sometimes more delicate than what we will practice today, but today we like things to be playful and simple, right? So we looked into the data set in the training set and um, yeah, so, so maybe let us, uh, you know, uh, uh, pick the text column and uh, take the first text and all right this text and um, turn it into an nlp document using our nlp function and then into a, an nlp data set right so we're just practicing what we did earlier just with this test sentence again and we see it uh, so this is not new and um and now um maybe uh, let us Visualize it. So uh, let us go to a browser with this uh, clay tool that we'll discuss more in future sessions, probably. So you see, it is very useful to have the entities colored because these entities uh, are now recognized by spacing, right? So, so we have here two kinds of entities in in the original data set, we had those entities that were annotation, annotated over the data by humans as the target for algorithms to learn. So for example, we have the from and to city and the departure and arrival time, right? But Spacey also has the ability to recognize entities but these would be a bit different. Spacey wouldn't know about from and to cities unless we teach it. And today we will not teach Spacey about new entities, even though that is something you can do with patterns, right? So, so we have those two kinds of entities and we are wondering, could we use 
spaces ability to recognize entities like a geographical location or a time or a date, who would we use that to actually recognize those desired entities in this data set? Mm, does it make sense? Uh, just one comment about yeah. the Atis data set. You might be wondering why the names of the cities are not capitalized and why there is no punctuation. And the reason is that it comes from speech recognition. So basically users uh, called some number and then it was transcribed automatically. And that's why we don't have this information, which makes our uh, NLP task a bit more challenging. Oh, thank you so much for this. I, I forgot this detail completely. And yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, you see, uh, we could visualize it and, and um, and have this uh, uh, look into entities. And uh, we can also visualize dependencies, right? So for example, uh, this, yeah, we already looked into this. And, but here you see how fun it is to use this hiccup notation of closure that allows you to create HTML, uh, uh, you know, in this joyful way with list items and such, and just, organize your visual information uh, easily. And it just works with these Python libraries as long as you just wrap them correctly. And yeah, and and uh, yeah, maybe let us look into the different, the different intents we have. So right, uh, we have uh, mostly the flight intent, but also others. And um, yeah, sorry. And yeah, and now, um, yeah, I'll skip a little bit, I think. And uh, now I'll, I'll actually add this uh, departure time column. So um, you see in some texts, the human annotation said, yeah, this text did have some departure time in it. Right, this one did have this, uh, uh, 8.38 a.m., right? So, oh, what happened? Yeah, yeah, so I just extracted that as a separate column so that it would be easier to reason about it. And uh, doing that with tablecloth is so fun. That is not the topic of today, but it was just uh, so joyful to have these internal data sets and extract some values from them. And yeah, anyway, uh, we'll play, play more with that one day and I will share this uh, uh, this uh, session later, this notebook. And, and yeah, so maybe let us ask uh, how often it happens that this new column we added, the departure time, how often does it happen that it is not nil or uh, that it is nil, right? So um, it is nil most of the time, but oh, 355 times, it was not nil. So it actually happens in the training set that sometimes the annotations do contain this departure time. So we could hope to have enough information to learn something about how to recognize departure times in these texts. And, you know, I'm just trying to give a taste of how it is to play with tablecloth and, and the bridge to Python and such. And it is okay if you don't understand all these examples. The, these will be topics of future sessions. And, and I'm happy to discuss it later with anybody who's curious. And yeah, maybe now let us look into a few examples where we have departure types. So um, you see, I'm taking the training set after this, this pre-processing and I'm selecting the rows where the departure time is not nil, which means those rows where the humans annotating the text said, yeah, we have some departure time in this text. And I'm just representing it a bit differently and organizing it in a colorful uh, HTML. And so, and it is so fun with this hiccup format. And yeah, and we have get this. So you see this part is the one colored by uh, display C, this uh, spacey uh, display library. And here I'm coloring this uh, this uh, label that I extract, extracted from the human annotations. So uh, those 
uh, and those entities recognized here are recognized by spacey in the, the, these colors, but the purple one is the one from the data set, the one we need to recognize as departure time. And you see, we have a problem. Of course, we have a problem because we need to, dis to discover this as a departure time, but in the data, uh, when we apply spacey, spacey would maybe re realize it is a time value, but not a departure time because it doesn't know what it is. And our goal is to, to define some algorithm to do that. And we'll just play with it a little bit, of course. And uh, does it make sense? Uh, I'm, you know, setting up the problem and uh, we'll go about these things more and more with different methods uh, in the future. Any comments, any thoughts? Yeah, so that's the statement of the problem. And, and, um, and now, you know, uh, maybe, uh, maybe let us try something, right? So let us um, maybe uh, take our data set and, um, and just pick uh, uh, just uh, one example that we uh, saw in the text, right? So this one, uh, this specific sentence. Let us see what we can do about it. So we can um, uh, pick the text part of it, which is just this text, and we can apply some pattern matching. Uh, so we can match for this pattern. So we are looking for the words before, after, or at, and then for a time entity, right? So let us see if this pattern will match this text. And sorry for the nesting here, we are kind of switching between the tablecloth way and the plain closure way. So this code might look confusing a little bit uh, and uh, maybe this way it is a bit more readable, but maybe, maybe um, I hope you don't care about it so much and you're getting the sense that these things can be playful in closure. And I think if you have had a little bit of closure experience, you know that having those maps and vectors as a way of representation can be so playful and joyful. And uh, right, so we see that if we define this pattern, just looking for these before, after, or at, and then a time entity, then we can recognize it happening two times in this piece of text. And uh, you, you see, uh, what we said here was that um, we're looking for a pattern that is composed of two tokens. The second token is a time token like 6 p.m. The first token, or I think six in this case because we recognize it. Uh, yeah, never mind about this uh, technical detail. But uh, it, because in spacey you could approach it, you could unify unify these two as one entity, to one token of time entity. But you could also, uh, depending on your pipeline, you could also define them as two separate token of time entity. And it, it depends on your choice how you would represent it. And I think now we are representing them as two, if I remember correctly, or maybe not. Yeah, but never mind. And what we are um, asking for in the previous token is that it would be some token where the lemma of this token, where lemma is this simplification of the word it into some common sense uh, uh, that is kind of avoiding uh, different variations of certain words. The lemma would be one of these. And we see that this pattern does find it in our text. And in this case, we were right if we wanted to use this pattern with this text. We were right about recognizes, recognizing these two entities as something about departure time, 
But of course, it could be that in some other text, we would not be right and they would be actually the arrival times. So we need a better pattern. Any comments, any questions about that? That makes perfect sense. It, it's almost begs if there's syntax to make certain patterns optional, almost like a like like a regex, right? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. And I think, yeah, let us try it for a moment. Uh, I think it is something like, uh, I forgot, but there is a way. Is it the star notation or, oh, I think, um, I just forgot you how to do it. write regex. Uh, oh, you mean op? Like repeat? Yeah, it? thank you. Yeah, so it would be op, right? And yeah, maybe maybe let us kind of make it more clear with a little example here. So we will match match like a little text like hello comma world or maybe hello world with um, the patterns where we first have something of lowercase low uh, something of lowercase comma and sorry and something of lowercase uh, world and we want to make the comma optional so I think it is op as Dimit said and I think star would make sense here or maybe question mark because we want to allow it uh, once so this does work because we made the comma optional and question mark is of the same meaning you would see in regular expressions for those who care about that, right? It is something that says you could have that thing maybe once, maybe none, right? And so uh, this works, but without making it optional, it would not work. Thank you, Dimid, for saving me. Yeah, I think we have three minutes to the official time and maybe it is a good moment to stop for a moment. And maybe in a moment we'll stop the recording and uh, some people may wish to stay a little bit later if it is not late on your side. I think what we did here was stating the problem and we will return to this problem in future sessions. sessions. And we demonstrated how we could play with NLP patterns in Spacey and we also realized that it is not so easy because you know how how in the world would be would we be able to kind of have more delicate patterns that would recognize it being a departure time and not an arrival time this tool is useful but limited you will see it in small projects as a way of defining patterns and recognizing things in this very very detailed way and that would be very much fun to do in closure i think you're getting a sense of it because of these uh, tiny little nice data structures but it would also be useful as a first layer in a sophisticated natural language processing pipeline that has many other things throughout the pipeline many more uh, powerful algorithms and we will look into these uh, in a future time and so that was a little taste of how we could use Spacey from Clojure for these very basic uses. Maybe I'll stop sharing now and um, uh, we could maybe have a few comments, questions, uh, brief ones before we kind of say goodbye to those who may need to leave, I guess. What do you think, Kira? Yeah, yeah, thanks so much for going through that all, Daniel. It's super interesting. Um, yeah, anyway, I think that sounds, Good to me. We have a couple minutes left until the uh, official time. We said we would wrap up. So if anyone has any questions, feel free. And also, like Daniel mentioned, we can stick around for a little bit longer. Um, if you would like, you're welcome to as well. You know, it's a lot to 
to take in. Was that, did you say something, Carson, or was that just a uh, background noise? <laughs> I have some background noise here, but uh, no, I just want to confirm as well that I think in the, in the area of, of, of data science, the interop is fundamental. Mm. And that is just, that is just for me, the reason for that is being that there are so many algorithms and most algorithms have a, are absolutely niche. So there are very few people who use them. So that means that they will not be redeveloped in, in closure in any time soon. So any sure. form of any any form of uh, uh, interop, uh, what we have seen today with Live Python CSJ into Python and R is absolutely absolutely fundamental and, and important. Voila, that is what yeah. my general my, my general experience, and that is really it comes from this fact that especially in the area of data science, yeah, as a, as a data scientist, what you want to do, you want you have a problem, you want to read the paper, and you want to do what is written in the paper. And if the paper says use Python algorithm X, then you don't want to reprogram something else. You want to use that algorithm. So basically you are not, you don't have a choice in most of the cases to say, okay, I use something different, similar, but if it exists in, jo in, in Java or, or Clojure, because then you change the algorithm basically, right? And that is my argument why it is absolutely important uh, to stay in the, in the interop due to, to, due to that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And just in terms of the amount of effort, I think, you know, it just doesn't make sense to be re-implementing super niche things in a whole bunch of different languages, like you said. So, and yeah, Python is clearly, you know, the kind of the dominant uh, language that a lot of these machine learning things have been developed in. So, yeah, it's cool to be able to see how to use them. And sure. you see that already in other areas, for example, it is feasible to, to redo something like pandas if you talk about data data manipulation, because table close, in my view, is very close to that. No, but if sure. you want to do the same, the same for the machine learning algorithms, that is impossible because there's such a huge amount of things uh, and nobody wants to re-implement them. That is why yeah. There's, of course, a little bit of, of duplication between R and Python because they are both very big uh, uh, ecosystems. Um, right. But I think, but I think uh, yeah, in any time soon, the, nobody will add a third language to these two. It will stick yeah. to Py Python R for, for a t very long time to come. Maybe Java yeah. has a chance, but even there, I don't see that happening really. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Thanks. Yeah, I think you, uh, Kira and Carsten, these comments help so much in, for the argument for why we began with that. And mm. maybe would it make sense, Carsten, if you if you like to comment comment a little bit about the NLP part of CycloGML, or should we keep that for another time? Um... I, there is not really a lot, huh? I've, uh, because basically Sky, Sky Closure ML is mainly based on, on what is existing in Smile, you know, the, the machine learning library Smile, and that has not a lot of NAP neither. Um, so uh, there, there's the, 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 the NLP part, I was looking a little, a little bit into that, but yeah, I came immediately to this problem that to, to develop where something something new which covers even a small part of what is existing in Python and R that is an endeavor which cannot be cannot be done. Uh, and the wrapping I, I'm always a little bit a little bit skeptical in pew in, in taking a full uh, uh, Python library and say I make a wrapper because that for me is like you we, you aim behind the moving target because these things are changing so quickly uh, that is impossible. What I see useful is what you have demonstrated today. So you basically, you develop your little, your little interop functions for the part you need for your problem and you wrap them in a closure function, but you don't do that thinking about sharing it. No, Daniel, that's what we have done today. So you wrote some nice uh, little functions which do the part you want to do for your problem and they become uh, uh, a nice closure function in the sense of they get uh, closure data structures in, closure structure data structures out. Inside they do interop, but uh, you don't, but I think it's impossible to think about writing these in a way which is reusable. Because then you come to the point that you want to wrap gigantic libraries like uh, 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 Spacey, you cannot 
I think it's impossible to think about something which wraps that completely because it's changing so quick, you cannot change your wrapper as quickly as it's changing. But it is true that libpython CAJ is very nice to use itself. So it is really fun to use it and do these little these little wrapping function as part of your work, but only the piece you want to use at a given time, but how you've done it today. So I think this is the right the right way to go. Yeah, and at the same time, CycloGML is offering wrappers of a few of those amazing collections like scikit-learn and this smile java library and this deep, yeah. deep java library right maybe yeah. these are the three main collections and so smile uh, cyclogml has a lot of effort of actually writing wrappers right it was not a lot of effort because they have a, they have the same interface all as all escalern estimators have the same interface so basically, I just needed to do a wrapper for the interface, not for the algorithms. So that is feasible and it's similar to Smile. There was a little bit of a problem with Smile in the beginning that not all Smile machine learning models had the same interface. So there was a little bit one of the reasons why uh, 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 there was a little bit of work there, but that is now the case. So that is feasible. If you have a big library and all the the uh, uh, machine learning or a lot of algorithms have the same interface, it is feasible to have a wrapper for the interface. So you get all the algorithms at the same time. But this is something which exists for machine learning as such, because the table is the input. So, so table are data. So because they all take a table as input and they give the model out. But I don't see this for the NLP part, because all NLP models or approaches have diff very different inputs and outputs. So you needed to do that, you needed to do the wrapping one by one. And that is, uh, I think, not feasible uh, uh, in my view. But that, that, is a, that is how I see the difference. So in, 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 in uh, Smile it is, or in Escalearn, it was indeed possible because Escalearn made the effort that all algorithms have the same Python interface. So the wrapper was simple and it's stable. It's stable as well. So that is uh, because, yes, Escalearn has this concept of the pipelines as well, and they wanted that all these estimators are easily combinable. So they needed the same input and output. So they have basically a very good architecture and that I don't see that happening for the NLP ecosystem. Uh, they are all models and algorithms. They don't have the same input and output. Yeah, so it's, it's different situation, I think. Thank you. It helps so much. Um, yeah, uh, maybe uh, Kira, maybe should we in a moment stop the recording and say goodbye to the recording? Uh, maybe you or Dimit have some conclusion to say. Uh, I only want to say thank you. Uh, it was, you know, uh, this this uh, group is so supportive of these explorations and such a joy to have these discussions. Yeah, yeah, this was a cool one for sure. So yeah, I don't think I much to add. Just yeah, big thanks to Dimit for joining us and teaching us a little bit about NLP and thanks to Daniel for the demo. And uh, yeah, I guess like I mentioned, um, myself and Daniel, and I'm not sure too sure about to me, but probably we're all available uh, like around the internet. If you have any questions or like if you have interest in this kind of uh, meetup, we could uh, potentially make this a recurring event. I think at the moment we don't have plans for like the next one anytime soon, but um, there are a lot of study groups that meet like every two weeks or every month or something like that. And I think this would be a really interesting topic for a lot of people. So, um, and definitely this like Closure Python interop stuff will be um, featured in the the closure cookbook and the data science course that is kind of sort of coming up this fall sometime. Um, so yeah, anyway, keep an eye out and feel free to get in touch anytime for any reason. And thanks so much for joining us. Maybe uh, Dimit has any comment, any any uh, final thought for today. Um, I just want to say that the interrupt between closure and by Python uh, feels so natural, so joyful. <laughs>